G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that fantastic podcast where we focus on sci-fi movies, TV shows and a bit of the old Australian sci-fi fandom. I'm your host Dags and with me is my co-host who is just so cool. Do you know he once wore a green spotted mattress costume in a convention costume parade and he actually won the award for best lay in town. Yes, it's Jeffro. <laughs> oh, what can I say? I do my best work when I'm uh, horizontal. Well, <laughs> well, as it is, that particular uh, costume is actually relevant for our topic for this evening, but we're going to get to that very, very soon because we actually did get some correspondence that did actually come in. And it was actually from uh, a good friend of ours, Russell Devlin, who we've referenced uh, on this show a couple of times in the previous episodes. And he wanted me to read out this quote. He said, thank goodness we have the honest voice of Jeffro, the sci-fi fan equivalent of Walter Cronkite. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the there news. That's right. That so was the news. It's a pretty obscure quote from a 1950s and 60s American newsreader. So uh, well done, Russell, for bringing up the past like that. Um, we've actually got some really cool stuff to talk about tonight. And as always, we've got a special letter of comment that's come through. Uh, so, Mr. Jeffro, uh, who sent through the letter uh, tonight and what is it about? Yes, as we have already said, we've got uh, people of all ages and, and all that uh, that have c come through and written letters to us. And this one is a really sweet man. He's in his 70s. And there's a clue there if you want to try and uh, get that one. And it's from Michael J. Fox on the Run. So, <laughs> Jesus. So, so uh, Michael J., the sweet old man from the 70s, has written, um, Dear nerds, I heard you're involved in something called Con 9, Con 70, and Con 80. What were these? And he's absolutely right. What were those? And we're going to answer that. Yes, uh, Con 9, Con, well, actually, they had proper titles. So Con 9 was actually called Con 9 from Outer Space. And that was in 2012. And ran for two days. Con 70 was called A Retro Sci-Fi Adventure. That was 2015 and ran for three days. And Con 80, the ultimate 1980 sci-fi experience, uh, was in 2017 and also ran for three days. And all three of these gigs were conventions run by a whole bunch of volunteers, not for profit, not for uh, autographs, not for photographs, They're none of that sort of stuff that you get in modern-day con trappings. And uh, it was a bit of fun. And both Jeffro and myself and Russell Devlin, funnily enough, who was mentioned earlier, were all a part of it. So brings back some memories, doesn't it? It does. And I thought the Con 80 uh, subtitle was, uh, what the heck are we doing a third one for? So, I mean, there's a lot of long sort of discussion to be held here, but Con 9 from Outer Space is where it all started from. So the idea was that it was a two-day convention. The reason it was two days is because at the time we had no idea how successful it was going to be. We only thought we'd get about 80 people turning up, if that. So it was only two days, and it was all based around science fiction, movies, TV shows, and radio plays dating from 1965 going backwards to effectively 1902. Uh, so it covered off all the 1950s and uh, the 40s and uh, and what have you, and uh, it ended up being a massive success and uh, to everyone's surprise. And what do you reckon, dude? Brings back some memories or what? Oh, absolutely, because I mean, we did cons in the uh, the 80s and 90s, and you used to be able to advertise it by going to uh, your club meetings, handing out flyers. There was newsletters that you could put like a one page ad in. So all that was completely changed in this modern day era because we didn't have club meetings. Really, we did have some. Uh, we we had very limited uh, newsletters. So. I found that when doing the publicity and all that, we really had to rely on trying to get uh, interest online. So I remember sort of like having to create a Facebook page to uh, to, to try and sort of put things on as well as, um, uh, you know, feeding the uh, interest through the internet, which wasn't easy to say the least. Yeah, so the interesting thing about these particular events is that they bucked the trend of what was going on with professional conventions of, of the time. And uh, most modern conventions uh, of the past 20 years, give or take, have all been focused around uh, the actors and the celebrities who attend and all the focus just goes on them. So we did the exact opposite. We didn't actually have any guests at all. And we uh, ran the events as they were run back in the old days 
in our era, like you said. So, uh, so as soon as you hear that, people are going to say, well, what exactly did we do for the two days or the three days? So we actually ran panel uh, discussions where uh, we actually had uh, people talking about various topics relating to the convention's theme. And that was primarily the main form of entertainment. So uh, you would actually, we had two rooms. So you effectively had 16 hours of programming per day, uh, eight hours in each room, just with panels and discussions regarding whatever the topic was. And it turned out that was actually quite successful and quite popular because that's how we used to do it back in the old days. And it's kind of funny because when the events were conceived, it was unknown as to how successful they would be because you're effectively trying to promote conventions to people who had forgotten what old school conventions were like. But as it turned out, a lot of people who uh, came along absolutely loved the format and uh, they wanted more of it, which was really quite surprising because uh, events like this just don't happen anymore. And when you consider we're programming two rooms, uh, eight hours a day over three days, essentially, that's a heck of a lot of program. And I was sort of uh, tasked with coming up with all the ideas. And I tell you what, it wasn't easy, but I think it all paid off. But the other interesting thing was that uh, looking for people to actually man the panels, I found there was actually quite an interest in people wanting to do them because uh, rarely do you get a chance to sort of do anything other than sit in the audience. But to be out front and centre and actually doing a discussion, I think people got a real kick out of being up there and actually uh, being uh, the people that get to speak as opposed to be spoken to. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, a lot of it was all just fans uh, just talking about the, the fields that they were specialists in. And... Uh... All three of the events had a very nice, intimate feel to them. I mean, they weren't that big. So, I mean, people probably think, oh, there's like thousands of people attended. Actually, in fact, I think it was about 130 to 150 attendees for the three events. So they didn't exactly like um, set any uh, great attendance records. But the venue we had was relatively small, so it was a lot more intimate. And, of course, one of the things that uh, we were really keen on doing was creating an atmosphere making it feel like you're actually at an event. So aside from having a big uh, display area, we put pictures all over the walls uh, for movies and TV shows from whatever theme that happened to be. Because I remember once I attended a sci-fi convention, I don't know, 15-something years ago, and it was a literature convention, so they focus on books and uh, things like that. And I remember turning up, and I thought, like, this could be a dentist convention. There was, like, absolutely nothing displayed <laughs> anywhere. And I thought... Who knows what this is? I mean, there was just like no thought or effort put into the atmosphere. And I was really disappointed by that. So I thought, well, for the three events that we're going to have, at least when people turn up, they are, they're going to know where they are and there'll be something to look at. And I thought that was actually really, really important. And uh, that was the thing. So the atmosphere was important to us. And we knew that they were going to be successful because after the first one, which was a bit of a roaring success, only going for two days, as we're packing up, even our own committee were uh, discussing about what the next one could be without even thinking, would there be a next one? And of course, as it turned out, there was. So, and there was one more after that. So yeah, it's pretty good. And in terms of atmosphere, I remember uh, when we were doing Con 70 and there was like a an Saturday evening that we had to provide the entertainment. I remember uh, you saying, well, we're going to do a 70s theme disco. And that actually involved getting a lighted disco floor, regardless of the cost. It was just like sort of, uh, let's do this. How awesome is this? And you actually uh, put it together. And it really felt, you know, so good to be able to sort of uh, get out on this um, uh, illuminated disco floor. And the other thing I remember, too, was in the uh, Con 80 um, programming on Saturday night, we actually had uh, movies shown on VHS tapes to keep in with the theme. And not only did we get to see the uh, ads that went on before the, um, the videotapes, but also uh, we had uh, uh, themed water. So DAGs actually created bottles of water that had movie-related labels from the 80s, as well as uh, popcorn. So uh, keeping with the uh, tradition of, you know, sort of making it something special, uh, those are some great examples of what we did. Yeah, we call those the convos, and it was just... One of those things that come into the heading and sound like a good idea at the time. So for the first, uh, which were Con 70, we produced um, convos where the, uh, we had bottled water, as you said, with the labels. But for the second one, which is Con 80, decided each uh, bottle had a different uh, film 
referenced on the label so no two were the same so they were instantly collectible <laughs> and i tell you what there was a bit of a fight over who got what and uh so they were actually uh, good fun to do and people really loved it and of course the funny thing is we never announced what the movies were going to be at all right there were complete secrecy uh about that so so for those who are wondering and this is the funny gag one of the uh movies that we showed was murder in space which was a 1980s big whodunit murder mystery where they didn't reveal who the killer as in this case the killers were in the in the main movie that didn't come out until the sec the sequel until i don't know a few months later it was a big competition so we showed that all right and everybody attended that and then we showed both versions so you had the murder in space plus the the resolution but Jeffro and I, for the life of us, can't think of what we showed in the first room. It was a movie of some sort, but no one knows what it was because we didn't announce it at all. I'm, I'm going to claim it's Buckaroo Bonsai only because I would have pushed for that. And I had the videotape of that. So my guess is the second one may be Buckaroo Bonsai, but uh, yeah. uh, our uh, memories are too foggy. And that wasn't more than about 10 years ago, was it? Uh, yeah, so that's the downside of actually you know, keeping things like a secret. But people didn't know what was going to be screened. It was really, really cool. So, yeah, I mean, there were other things too. So, like, when people turned up, uh, we kept the thing, everything very, very traditional. So people actually got a con bag, which even today you don't even get at you know, conventions. And we had a, a con book as well, which was a book specifically uh, produced for the three events. And con books don't even exist anymore. So these were all the normal con trappings of conventions, like back in the 20th century. And they're all gone, and a lot of people sort of got those books, and I've kept them as mementos. And uh, it was just something you could look back upon decades from now, and hopefully a lot of people will and uh, look upon the, all three events uh, very fondly. Particularly the uh, the badges, because they were all individually made, so uh, there had to be some sort of bunny that actually had a, a badge stamping machine and was making them. And I remember at the time you could actually, if you wanted to, pick your own number. So, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of fun with uh, people picking some uh, creative uh, numbers. Yeah, actually, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, I mean, I had the idea of doing badges. So this is the old buttons if you're in America. And, you know, once again, it sounded like a good idea at the time until you start having to produce hundreds of the damn things. And, and aside from the, like, with the programming, aside from the panel rooms, there was also video programming rooms as well. So Russell Devlin, who we've mentioned previously, he ran uh, one room which was devoted just to TV shows. And you'd be thinking, who would go to a convention to watch TV shows? Well, sure enough, people would, especially if there were things they hadn't seen before. And uh, a good friend of ours who passed away uh, a year or two ago, Garfield, uh, ran the film program in the second room. And he came down from Sydney, all three events, to uh, to just show um, classic sci-fi movies from whatever the theme of the convention was. And that was good. So aside from the two panel discussion rooms and the two video programming rooms, as well as the display room, which was also the dealer's room, there was something for everyone. And, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody walked around thinking they had nothing to do. Although it was funny that sort of uh, there'd be some people that would think, oh, where's the uh, the – the big star that you're going to bring along and of course there wasn't so uh it's like you know we were always straightforward from the very beginning there is no star you know sort of there's there's no autographs and all that but still there'd be people inquiring saying surely there's going to be a, an actor or something like that and i think the closest thing we had was an indie director so uh we at least yeah. sort of satisfied that yeah, so it's interesting for people who are wondering, so like what would an event like this cost? Now, the, the thing about uh, running a self-funded convention, which is not being run for profit, is that uh, when you do the numbers and you say, well, okay, if you get 80 attendees and there's no guests at all, how, come, how much can you charge? And if you look at your costs and you go, well, my costs are 20-something thousand dollars, that would mean that an attendee would have to be charged Eighty, a hundred dollars, whatever, to try and make your money back. But of course, if you do that and there's no guests, no one's going to go. So we had to take a, a conscious decision to make the price cheap. Uh, I think because starting with Con Knife Matter Space, I think because it was our focus was primarily the 1950s, we made it fifty bucks for the weekend, twenty five dollars a day, and uh, and that's how it sort of worked. So it was intended to be a one off event only. And it was um, budgeted to run at a financial loss because we couldn't put the prices up because, as I said, there was no guests coming. So we thought, okay, if we make it cheap, it'll encourage people to turn up. And it did. And as it turned out, the budgeted loss is exactly what happened. So, And it was fine. It was all good. It was all planned. It was great. It was wonderful. 
And it was only meant to be just a one-off thing. And uh, who knew that it would actually end up growing into the next two events, and which in their own right were actually sort of larger and a bit more involved. And, of course, after the whole thing had finished, after Con 80 had finished, all people wanted to know is when Con 90 was going to occur. And our plan was always just to do the three conventions, and that was it. So there's never going to be a fourth one. But, I mean, even as far as this year, I've still had people come up to me and say, what would it take to run a fourth convention, right? And, of course, the first one is just money. Someone's got to foot the bill for it. And these things aren't cheap to run. So even without guests and anything like that, just um, venues alone and quite, you're probably looking at a $25,000 investment and you probably won't get that money back, which is one of the reasons that all of our conventions, we ended up auctioning off everything that we had in it uh, at the, uh, the, the fire sale auction at the end of the convention. So everything, all the posters, all the badges, everything we had left over would be sold off to try and make money back so our losses wouldn't be as bad as what they were planning to beat i do remember how tight the budgets were because i remember we used to agonize as to how many con books we're going to print up because if you print too many then you've got all these surplus con books left over and you've paid for something that you can't really use whereas if you under cater then you're trying to make um con bags up for people that are arriving on the day that you don't know are going to be there and you you run short and you feel a bit bad because you haven't been able to give them a con book so there's a lot of um, discussion about what would be the right number we just had to take educated guess and um, hope for the best yeah that's exactly right so but it all worked out pretty good we had people coming in from interstate uh, as well there's even a couple who came from overseas and I think a lot of people really dialed into it and were thinking well what a shame this doesn't happen more often. But unfortunately, for events like what we organised, there's a lot of time and effort involved. It didn't just happen overnight. There was like a year's worth of planning. Um, as you said, you know, when you're doing the programming, you've got to tee up all the, the speakers and the presenters. Uh, the guys doing the videos had to do their bit, the displays, the con books. All that took time and effort and plus the promotion as well. And as far as we're aware, they may have been the only ones of their type in the entire world conventions are devoted to a specific decade of sci-fi movies and tv shows so i don't know i would like to think so i mean these days everybody's trying to go as broad as they possibly can i mean uh, if you say doctor who it's still rather broad because it involves you know all you know sort of 13 14 doctors whereas we're sort of focusing on a very specific topic so uh, yeah i think we are quite unique in that respect yeah, yeah, exactly right. And it was very funny. Even with Con 9 from Outer Space, and I said it's from 1965 backwards, people would say to me, oh, hang on, Doctor Who came out in 1963. We're covering that. I thought, you're missing the point. And if you want to go and talk about Doctor Who, there's fan clubs everywhere and conventions everywhere. We're talking about the stuff that people aren't talking about. <laughs> That's the thing. We're focusing on these things that everybody's forgotten. I remember with uh, Con 9, as we said it uh, uh media up to 1965 it's like some people going can't we like squeeze batman 66 in there it's only one year <laughs> off you know come on just just nobody will know it's like uh dags was very specific we have a cut off and it's not going to include batman 66 or anything else like lost in space or uh, what have you it's like 65 is the cutoff so if you want to learn more about what the conventions look like there were websites created for them so if you want to have a look at those websites uh, they're still up but they're under my own personal website so you need to go and just google darren dags maxwell and my website should be the first one that pops up and if you go to my website it's on the left hand side uh you've got the con 9 con 70 and con 80 links for the conventions and uh, you get to sort of see what it was all about and um, if you sit there and you go oh wow that'd be awesome I'd love to go to a gig like that because people would say oh I missed the first one I'll go to the next one and go but there's no next one <laughs> there's no next one you once you miss out you miss out oh I've got to admit I had a bit of a laugh over that so what do you reckon Jeffro? Well, I've got all my happy snaps, so that uh, takes me back. And I've also got signs from each individual uh, convention up on my walls. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll never forget them because I'm surrounded by uh, imagery of them. Fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. So who do we have to thank for that fantastic letter of comment there, Jeffro? So that was the uh, sweet man in his 70s called Michael J. Fox on the Run. Good stuff. Very, very cool. Now, at the very start of the episode, I actually mentioned that uh, Jeffro was famous for being in a costume parade wearing a mattress with green spots. What was that, by the way? <laughs> what was that, by the way? 
Well, that was where I was not a very good costumer and I was using stuff from work. So famously, one of my costumes was a, uh, a big black Mars bar because I had access to a big uh, black plastic sort of uh, material that I could easily use. And the same thing with the, um, the the mattress costume. It was stuff that I made at work. So I just basically sort of stuck these things on and, and, and uh, stitched it all together. And uh, it's like sort of way you go. But I think my most embarrassing costume was probably my uh, John Luke picnic one where I had to wear pink lycra. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely famous. But that actually leads us directly into our topic of conversation for this evening, Mr. Jeffro. What is it uh, that we're going to be discussing? Yes, so uh, this one is modern cosplay, making costumes versus buying them. So we've both won awards uh, and we've done costumes. And uh, this is our sort of uh, uh, opinions on what the values are of making your own costume versus the, uh, the values of simply buying them off the rack. So costuming in the past 20 years has become an industry unto itself. It's gigantic. A lot of people are really involved with it. It's international. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the pop culture expos, both here in Australia and overseas, because as we discovered, you know, if you go to a convention and you wear a fantastic costume, but only 150 people see it, you're thinking, well, what was you know, what was the big deal with that? But if you go to an event and there's 40,000 people there, clearly you're going to put a bit more effort into it because you want uh, as much exposure as, as, as you can possibly get. And over the past couple of decades, that's just grown and grown and grown to be this gigantic industry, as I said. And now, of course, you know, if you want a costume of just about anything, uh, and if you can't make it, you can pretty much buy it online. There are places primarily, I think, in Asia where um, you could say, well, I want a Star Trek The Wrath of Khan costume, and if I'm prepared to cough up two and a half grand, I can get the best-looking Star Trek costume I can get. And that's a good thing. It gets a lot of uh, exposure for a lot of people. But, of course, on the other side of the coin, if you can make your own outfits, uh, which is uh, limiting people significantly because not everybody can do that, does that make you the better costumer, I guess? What are your thoughts? Because as you said, both of us have won costuming awards, albeit on a local level. So, you know, if I say Jeffro did actually win an award for the best lay in town, uh, that was at a convention with only like 90 people in it. But still, you are an award-winning costumer, as am I. So uh, what are your thoughts on the whole thing? I mean, it's one of those things where because of the rise of the internet and uh, social uh, media and all that, it's it really does mean as you said sort of when you used to go to a convention only the people that uh, were there saw the costumes but now as soon as you have a um, an event of any sort there's going to be people with their mobile phone cameras taking snaps and it's it's going to be out there so i do feel a little bit guilty about this myself because whenever there was a, a comic con on you know it's like I would tend to sort of uh, go and see what all the costumes were like because I was very interested. And I looked at them all and I'm, I'm just saying, well, there's probably some very good ones in there that uh, were made by experts, but there was a good portion that were probably bought. And I think when it comes to the bought ones, if it's a, a major character, then you're more likely to think that it was uh, bought, where if it's a unique sort of character... Uh, particularly, say, if it's a, a one from a comic book or a role-playing game and all that. If you see something like that, then uh, you tend to think, well, that's probably something that person has made. Clearly, the skill set to make outfits has grown significantly over, say, our era, whereas in our time, um, if you knew somebody who was a seamstress, and we'll say it's a female, and a fan, they were indispensable because if you said to them, oh, I need a Jedi costume, they already knew what that was as opposed to someone out in the street who would have no freaking idea what a Jedi looked like. So um, whereas now clearly um, there's been a big demand for people to say, I need to learn how to make, uh, how to sew as well as make um, you know, armour and uh, all these other bits and pieces. So, um, yeah, it's sort of interesting how it's all sort of grown. I do remember seeing there was like some sort of American cable show and what it was was it's a reality show where they got like a dozen or so cosplayers and they had to compete against each other to see who could make the best costume. I mean, this is a real show that's on uh, cable TV. And, uh, of course, 
they need judges and they introduce the judges and these cosplayers are going, oh my goodness, that's such and such. And, um, and it's like there is obviously different levels of professional costuming. So, uh, and and this this is a thing where it's like, you know, you get people that uh, uh, are professional costumers that uh, can make an income just for the fact that they are professional costumers. I know this is slightly getting off the topic a little bit. The downside, as I discovered, about being the whole professional costuming thing is the fun's gone out of it. Suddenly you've got to produce new material every time. You can't wear the same outfit twice, so to speak. You've got to, you know, you've got to, there's an air of expectation that, uh, okay, once I've been to a gig and I've worn an outfit, I can't wear that outfit ever again. Um, and they've got to produce something new just to keep the image up. I mean, we knew people uh, in our time who would have a really high quality self-made originally designed costume and they would win costume and um, parade awards and all they would do for other events is just modify the same outfit so they'd have a helmet with horns so they change the horns to some other shape thing and they change the color of this to some other color so it was the same but slightly different but because the overall image looked really really good they would just constantly win awards again and again and again and i thought that was a bit of a cheats way of doing it but it was a self-made thing so um now in our time for example um if you wanted armor right i mean you have to make it out of cardboard there was the only way to do it right it was really rare to find anybody who could back form anything and there were a couple of people who did it professionally and uh, and they did quite well for themselves but otherwise armor um, not not a hope in hell right 3d printing clearly didn't exist and there were a couple of people who did actually turn to fiberglass right whereas today this stuff is everywhere and i remember i went to a, a pop culture event and i saw a dude wearing uh the master chief from halo all right and i thought holy shit, that is really spectacular it was really really cool that where do they even get that from how do they even make that right and now it's as commonplace as anything it's like stormtrooper suits right that you see from star wars right you know back in our day there's only one person who could make stormtrooper suits in this country and he had the monopoly on them accordingly and there wasn't that many now they're everywhere and that to the point you actually just you don't even look at them anymore because you've seen so many of them and it's just kind of funny how the world has changed from what we had to put up with and say, well, I want to make a, this costume and I physically can't do it. I don't have the skills and there's no one I can turn to. Whereas now um, you say, well, you know what? I really wouldn't mind an Iron Man costume. You could probably buy one from somewhere. Crazy. And there's that pressure now, I think, because of the uh, uh, the internet era that maybe you're seeing everyone else uh, do these costumes and you have to sort of come up with something yourself. So just to turn up to a, uh, a big uh, pro convention in, in a T-shirt doesn't seem to quite cut it with a lot of people these days. So, you know, where else do you turn when you don't really have the, uh, uh, the talent? Or if you do turn up in one of these things and you make it yourself and it's not that uh, good... It's like people will just sort of uh, maybe, you know, turn their back or laugh at you or criticise you and, and and people can't really sort of bear that these days. So they've got a standard that they've got to try and meet. So sometimes buying a costume is the only way they're going to achieve that level of standard that's been set. Yeah, it's a good point because both you and I have worn outfits that we created ourselves, right, in varying degrees of quality and style and, and complexity and whatever else and i think that's something that uh, some people do turn to they go you know what if i do a replica of a movie or a tv show it's going to get analyzed to the nth degree but if you wear something it will create something that is your own design that's interesting because you can say this is inspired by this or this is inspired by that and we knew actually a couple of costumers in particular who would do that they would take a, a star trek costume for example from next generation and modify it into something that was unique and different of their own thing they didn't do it as a joke they actually did it seriously so it's like they're saying well okay let's assume that in the federation universe there's commandos what would they look like what would they be dressed as and these there's this sort of style there or you can say this person would say well i'm on a starship that doesn't appear on screen this is the outfit that i've got so they're actually modifying the existing costumes and that was actually quite popular and successful because you weren't exactly copying what you'd seen on screen but you did your own interpretation of it as well but of course in both of these instances that i can think of um the people did it themselves but that's one way of getting around the problem of being criticized too much is by producing your own material but 
if you're going to do that, it's still got to be something that stands out from the crowd. And that's the hardest part, I think. And I certainly think it's easier for females than it is for guys. Um, I saw a video of a, uh, I mean, an American one. It was just a compilation. It was really well done. It was really professional. A compilation of all these costumers from pop culture conventions in America where a person would appear on screen for two or three seconds showing off their outfit, saying who the person was. Then there's the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, set to music. And it looks looked awesome. I didn't even know what half those outfits even were, but most of them were female. And I think there's a, a lot to be said that if you're a, a young female, you've got a better chance of standing up in the crowd than if you're a young guy, as a guest. So, yeah. The ones that I, I see and I, I quite enjoy because it's not so much about their uh, uh, expert crafting of the costumes, but it's the clever idea is is there's a lot of mashups. So I remember seeing there was like someone dressed up as a South Park figure, but they did it in a Star Wars costume. Uh, there's another one that was, um, he's a famous singer called Darth Elvis. So he dresses up like Elvis Presley, but he has a Darth Vader mask. So it's just a, a, a mashup like that. And there's some really weird mashups uh, that uh, you just think, well, that's very clever. And even something as simple as I remember uh, someone once came as um, Bruce Wayne's parents and they had like sort of, uh, you know, sort of all the blood on the uh, the costumes and things like that. And um, so you can you don't necessarily have to be uh, spectacular, but you can certainly be uh, creative in your ideas. Depends on what it is that you want, though. I mean, it, it, are you looking for attention and, and the big internet sensation or are you just thinking, oh, I just want to be different? And I guess if you are turning up to an event in an outfit, especially as you, like you sort of mentioned earlier, you've made yourself, but you don't get the attention, uh, would that sort of like sort of feel like, well, I'm being shot down in flames a little bit. So if you said, I'm going to wear a Star Wars costume of a particular character and I've made it myself, but the standard isn't that flash versus someone who's bought their own costume and they're standing right next to me, but they're getting all the attention because they look good, but they bought theirs, but I made mine, but I don't look as good. How do you reckon that stacks up? Well, I, I know that I did a Chewbacca costume that uh, I made myself, but I would sort of be uh, not likely to ever present it again because if there's a professionally made Chewbacca, you know, I would just sort of be so embarrassed to sort of be there in comparison. So uh, it does make it a bit tough for the, uh, the people that make their own costumes. Yeah, I think you do actually have a bit of a, a, a sort of a strong will to say, you know what, I've made it myself. It doesn't compare anywhere near as what the professionally made ones are, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm proud that I did it myself. I think all power to you uh, if that's the case. But, uh, yeah, I think the worst part would be you go to an event and go, look, I made it myself. I'm really proud of that. Anybody taking pictures? Nah, they're all going <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> that's going to that's gonna be a bit of a kick to the ego. But, uh yeah, it's interesting. Um, this is the irony of it all, right? So costuming was such a big deal in the late 90s and the old 2000s. There was actually a group called the um, uh, the Costumers Guild. And the prerequisite for the Costumers Guild is that you had to make your own outfits. And they were actually a bit of a big deal for a period of time, especially in the early 2000s. And the funny thing was, and this is the thing I, I, I just spins me out this, there was a whole bunch of them. There was a group and they used to run their own banquets and be, their, their costume parades were really, really big events and they were really, really proud of them. But they kind of folded up about two years before the first Armageddon in 2007. So if those people had stuck it out for another couple of years and went to an Armageddon, they would be lauded as costuming gods because not only was their stuff awesome, but they made it themselves. But they're, they're just gone now and it's just like they just missed the boat by uh, two or three years and there was one person who was part of that group uh who was notorious in the costuming circles because he made all of his um armor suits out of metal and he would actually make colonial marines armor from uh, aliens and he would actually bang it out of metal and it looked freaking awesome he was way above everybody else like stood above everyone and like he was like an absolute god in terms of his material, his stuff was awesome. It was looked great. And the fact that he was using a, a product that nobody else was even contemplating really made him stand out. But he was gone from the scene before the first Pop Culture Expo in 2007 and nobody knows who he is. And it's such a shame because if he had stuck it out, then he could have got a bit more use out of that costume. And with the internet sort of uh, popularity rising, that 
that uh, costume could have seen a lot more uh, views out in the uh, the wider world. So these things happen. But I do wonder what um, people that do make costumes do after the fact. Do they have a big room full of them or whether they decide to trash them or whether they sell them on? That would be an interesting question to know. Yeah, I have known people who have built their homes. Um, there was a couple that uh, both of us knew who were married and they were both into costuming. And in their master bedroom, instead of having a uh, walk-in wardrobe and an ensuite, they actually turned an ensuite into another walk-in robe. So he had his and she had hers. And it was mainly for storing costumes back in the, in the day. I thought, that's something you don't see every day. So, uh, I mean, I certainly think the people that make the costumes are the ones that still get the most attention. I mean, for um, for all those sort of pre-done costumes like Spider-Man and your Marvel ones and all mm. that, I think people just subconsciously know that that's bought. Where if you see something original, that's where people will start to crowd around and look at that. So uh, uniqueness has always been a, a, a draw factor. So I guess the, the bottom line is that you go, you know what, I really just want to wear a costume of a blah, but I want it to be a, a relatively good-looking one it's a lot easier now than it was, say, back in our day. So you can look online and go, you know what, I really do want that Ratha Khan costume. I can just cough up the money, put it on, and I'm good to go. Um, and it's kind of funny because had the the costume that won the uh, the big Best in Show at AussieCon 2 back in 1985, uh, do you remember what that was? Oh, crikey, no. Uh, so it was a guy from Sydney who actually was a professional costumer for movies and TV shows. He came uh, as a dragon and the eyes lit up and the wings that folded out and all this sort of thing. It was just like absolutely mind-boggling just how good it was. Even that today in a pop culture expo would draw in the crowds big time. And, uh, and of course, that was made almost 40 years ago. So uh, pretty incredible stuff. So yes, we have known people who've done some awesome, awesome things, just stuff that is just like bedazzles the mind. Just as an aside, we once had a guy in 1991 got dressed as Edward Scissorhands, absolute dead ringer for what stepped off the screen. Even the hands were made of metal and everything. It was just awesome. If that was worn at a gig today, you'd see him like front page news on whatever costuming newsletters and social media outlets there are out there but it's all long gone now so uh yeah you remember that one don't you i do remember that one and uh it was one of those ones where as soon as he walked on stage just everyone was thinking well you win no no there's no competition you can't beat that and he needed like 15 cans of hairspray just to get his hair teased <laughs> oh, look, it was like one of those awesome uh what do you call it screen accurate costumes you'll ever see and unfortunately, that was back in 1991, so that is just a uh, long gone now. So speaking of things that are long gone, it's time for us to go. So how's a nice little segue? What do you reckon that, Jeffro? <laughs> I hope people have enjoyed the uh, the conversation, and it does mean that if you have some comments yourself, please put them in the uh, notes below, and we'll actually uh, look forward to reading them. Absolutely fantastic. So anyway, if you're going to, whether you buy it or make it, just wear it, enjoy yourself, get 50 million photographs, and... Uh, and if you want, here's one for you. If you want to do an awesome replica of a costume, get dressed as us, Jeffrey and me. And it is a true story that there was once a party being held at my house decades ago. Come as your alter ego, and Jeffro came dressed as me. So there you go. I did, and I've never had a more popular photo sort of liked in uh, my Facebook page than that. So uh, obviously, being you is very successful. <laughs> <laughs> You do me better than I can. Oh, there you go. Anyway, we're going to buzz off tonight. Be sure to look after yourselves. Party harder, rock on. And as always, make sure you stay nerdy. Stay nerdy. Bye, guys. That's all, folks. <laughs>